Well, so let's go on with our study of ruled surfaces. Okay, we interrupted. We took a bit of time speaking about spaghetti, but now let's go back. Remember which are the data of such a surface. We have a curve, the directrix, and a, fam a one parameter family of lines, okay? W, so we call it alpha t, w of t. And we are looking at the, at the map x, t, v equal to alpha plus t, w, plus v, w, meaning W is working for us just to give a direction, and for each direct, for such a direction, we put on the surface the whole line, the whole straight line in this direction, while something is moving, the point is moving on a, on a given curve alpha. Okay? We saw a few examples. Let me add just one example, which will turn out to be important later, which is called the tangent surface to a curve. I mean, this is adds to the list, okay? Last time we made m many examples of this type of surfaces. Tangent surface to a curve. What does that mean? That means just, so it's a one line example in the sense that you, given any curve alpha, for any alpha, I can take W to be the tangent vector to alpha, okay? So in this case, of course, my surface will look like alpha plus V alpha prime, okay? So geometrically, is a particularly simple situation. You have a curve in space, and you add, for every point of this curve, the whole line tangent to it, okay? We are going to give us a, a kind of a classification of surfaces where this type will, uh, will be one type of, of such surfaces, okay? So... Let's keep it in mind, but of course, it's a very special example. In any case, given this type of surfaces, so now let's go back to the general case, alpha and w. Let's compute first, second fundamental forms and curvatures. Okay, well, we know how to do it. So x, x, uh, xt, okay, in this case, the variables are not u and v, but t and v. Okay, so the first one would be xt, is alpha prime plus v w prime. I drop the dependence on the para okay, on, on what they depend, it's clear. It's written there. Okay, so xt is this one. xv is just w. xtt is alpha double prime plus v w prime. xtv is just w prime. Okay, and xvv is equal to zero. So then what is the normal to such a surface? Remember, actually, one general comment. We are performing the usual theory without worrying too much if this is the parameterization of a regular surface. So remember, there is the problem of, for example, of injectivity of this map, which is highly false in general. Okay, so we perform it formally, and the, the computations we are going to do will work in the parts on the parts of the surfaces of the surface for which this is a good map. Okay, so we have to be careful where to in make interpretations. Okay, but let's go on. Now n, n would be what? Would be xt wedge cross product xv normalized. Okay. Well, there is nothing, not not much more that we can say. I mean. We have to do the cross product of these two. And in general, we have no information. Of course, cross products simplify if you know that something is parallel to something else or something is orthogonal to something else. In this case, we have no information in general about properties, mutual properties of these vectors, alpha prime, w prime, and w. They are almost free to be whatever they want. Okay? So let me, I, I leave n in this form. And then, depending on the situation, we can make uh, further analysis. So, how much would be E? Okay, so I don't write it because I would just write the general formula, okay? So, what is the, the, which are the coefficients of the first fundamental form? Well, I have to take 
xt scalar product n, okay, sorry, uh, uh, first fundamental form, xt xt, okay, so, well, in this case, In this case, I made a mistake here, but that's okay. Okay, this is the norm squared, and again, I cannot really say anything. Okay, so it's just the norm squared of, of this vector. Okay, how much is f? f, again, would be the scalar product between this and this, and I have no, much, no, no information to use, so it would be alpha prime scalar w plus v w prime scalar w, okay, whatever they are. And what is g? And g is just the norm squared of w, okay? How much are the coefficients of the second fundamental form? Well, let me not even write little e, because little e will be the scalar product between this and this. But, okay, it's, it, I have not, no formula to use, so besides rewriting the definition, there is nothing I can say. Let's see what is little f. Little f would be the scalar product between n and x tv, okay? So let me introduce a notation. If I take the scalar product, so some uh, notation, If I have three vectors, A, B, C, okay, in R3, in fact, in, uh, wherever you want, in Rn, but I mean, I, I call the bracket A, B, C is by definition the scalar product, A scalar product B cross C, okay? This is a standard uh, notation in many books that you will find, so better get used to that. I mean, it's not a great simplification. You know? <laughs> it's almost the same number of symbols anyway. Uh, because now, what is f? f, you see, it's the scalar product between a vector, sorry, a vector and uh, a cross product. So I can use immediately that notation there, and that becomes uh, alpha prime. Alpha prime, w, w prime divided by the norm of n, okay? So now, okay, I can I add the formula for the norm of n, which is alpha prime cross w plus v w prime cross w. This is nothing but substituting the norm of this, okay? I'm not cheating you. I mean, this is just what I would get here immediately, okay? And then how much is g, little g, in the second fundamental form? Well, this is the best one because of course it's zero scalar, whatever, so it's zero. That's why I don't have to compute little e, because in all formulae, I mean, for example, in the Gauss curvature, I would get eg. So if g is zero, I don't care about e, okay? So having done this, how much is the Gauss curvature? Well, it's eg minus f squared. So eg minus f squared divided by eg minus f squared, that becomes, so eg is zero, so minus this, this object here, alpha prime squared divided by alpha prime cross w plus v, v w prime cross w squared. This would be just f squared, minus f squared, so times one over eg minus f squared. And I don't even write it, okay? Divided by eg minus f squared. You substitute those almost generic functions and that's it, okay? Because this is enough to make some considerations. You see, any ruled surface has Gauss curvature less than or equal to zero because whatever this is, this is a positive function because it's the determinant of the first fundamental form, one over. Okay, so if this is positive, this is of course positive, and this is minus something squared, okay? So this is less than or equal to zero, and in fact is zero if and only if
this, so, this number is 0. OK? Now, I don't go through the examples we made. Now, you have this nice formula, and you can substitute in the hyperbol one sheet hyperboloid, for example, or in the cylinder. For example, this is another way to compute the Gauss curvature of, cylinder, of the cylinder, or general cylinders, or of a cone. I mean, now, you pick all those examples. You have the explicit expression for alpha, w, and w prime. You substitute, and you get the result. Okay. But now it's clear that the vanishing of this function is measuring something interesting. So let's see if how many times we can reach this, this position. Now, in general, so no loss of generality. You see, the role of w, we said at the beginning, is just to point in the direction, so to give me a direction. So there is no arm. I mean, I'm studying the same surfaces if I assume the norm of w to be constant equal to 1. OK, if I have, some, if I have a one-parameter family of lines where w is, the norm of w is a function, of course, I can rescale. And I get the same surface because it's giving the same direction. So since I'm adding the whole line, I don't care. It will change the, the value of v for which I touch a point, but I don't care. The image is the same. OK, so no loss of generality in assuming this. OK, but this is technically convenient. But before seeing why, definition, a ruled surface is called developable, developable. If this num this function is zero, if alpha prime w w prime is equal to zero, okay, or equivalently if the Gauss curvature is constant equal to zero, okay. Okay, we have given a name, but we could have been giving a name to a the empty set, for what we know. Okay, how many surfaces are developable? OK, now let's see. So now, suppose we have a developable surfaces. surface. So let's see if we can identify it in some form. OK. Well, first, and this has nothing to do with the developability, we have put this uh, normalization on the direction. OK. How do I translate it? As usual, if I have a family of vectors of given norm, I take the derivative and I get one equation between the scalar product of the vector and its derivative. OK. Nice. So now let's see in how many ways I can get this. OK, of course, this is the scalar product between this vector and the cross product of these two. So first case when this is 0, for example, when the cross product of these two is 0. Of course, if, this is, if the cross product of these two is 0, whatever is alpha, I get 0. So let's first see if I can understand the geometry of such a surface. So case 1, if w cross w prime is equal to 0. What can I say? Well, if the cross, pro the cross product of two vectors is 0, if and only if they are proportional. OK? So this implies that, let's see in which way I prefer, w prime of t, now let me rewrite what they depend on, lamp is equal to some number, but which in principle depends on t, times the other one. So they are proportional, but the factor of proportionality depends, could depend on t. OK? Very well. But I have this equation here, so let's use it. So on one hand, I have 0 is equal w scalar w prime. 
But now I have also this equation. So if I substitute to w prime this, I get what? I get lambda w w. But w w is equal to 1. OK, so this is equal to lambda. So in fact, the second equation, for, so the developable equation, forces this factor of proportionality to be constant equal to 0. OK? But then, well, but then the geometry of the surface is, is almost trivial, because that means w prime is constantly equal to 0. But that means that w is a constant vector. And we have given a name to such surfaces. So that implies w of t is equal to some w0, if you want, independent of t. So the surface is a, what we called a cylinder. Okay? It's, the, it's a generalized cylinder, of course. Now drop from your mind, the idea that the cylinder is only the rotation invariant straight cylinder. Okay? So there is a curve, and there is a constant vector, and you are taking the surface, which at each point of this curve takes the line in this parallel direction. So cylinder. Very well. Well, but this was, of course, the first trivial case. I mean, this color product is 0 because one of this vector is zero. OK. Case two. Well, of course, suppose now that we are not in that situation. <coughs> Another way to say it is, of course, this is non-zero. That means the two vector, these two vectors are linearly in independent this time. Okay. It's the contrary of the situation before. But the scalar product between alpha and, and the, the cross product of these two is 0. But that means that the triple alpha w w prime are linearly independent. So alpha, OK, sorry, linearly dependent. are linearly dependent. Sorry? Sorry, alpha prime, alpha prime. Yes, of course. That's the information coming from here. So now it's a, a little bit like before, but it's slightly more complicated, because if they are linearly dependent, for example, I mean, Let's assume that alpha, I express la alpha prime in terms as a li of a linear combination of the other two. So alpha prime of t would be, so there will be now again two functions, because the coefficients are free to depend, to move in time. But there are, there are coefficients such that something like this holds for some choice of lambda and mi or two functions, lambda and mi, OK? So then set, so this is just now a convenience, uh, alpha tilde of t. Let's define another curve by just alpha, alpha of t. You see, I want to change the, di the directrix of my surface without changing the surface. Remember that a ruled surface have, has many, infinitely many directrix. So in this case, it's clear. That if I take alpha minus this, uh, I take this on this side, I mean, minus mu, well, with, before taking the derivatives, but minus mu w, I'm doing something smart. Because what is alpha tilde prime of t? Well, alpha tilde prime of t is, of course, alpha prime minus, of course, I introduce a little mistake because I had to take the derivative also of this function w minus mu w prime, OK? <coughs> but then again, I use the equation defining lambda and mi. And this is equal to what? This is equal to mi, mi minus mi prime w of t, OK? Because 
alpha prime minus mi w prime lambda, sorry. Uh, and where do I put it? Here, alpha prime minus, so this is lambda minus mi prime. Okay. Now, so this case two must split now into subcases. So case, if you want, 2A, okay, subcase A. Suppose that alpha prime is constant, alpha tilde prime is constantly equal to zero, okay? Well, what does it mean? It means that alpha tilde is a constant vector. Let's say some kind of alpha naught. So it's a given point of... Um, Okay, but then what? Then alpha, well, this is, of course, the trivial case. Alpha is, what is it? Here, alpha is equal to alpha tilde plus mi w, okay? So alpha of t is equal to alpha naught plus mi of t, w of t, okay? But you see that we have not changed the surface. So what is x? X is t, X of TV, now let's write everything just to be sure that we are not making mistake, is alpha, so then it's alpha naught plus mi of t, w of t, plus v, w, okay? Okay? Now we could go on with analytic interpretation, but now the geometry is clear. What is the geometry of such a surface? You see, W, of course, I can, the only thing I, I would like to, okay, let's do it, but I mean, it's me plus V W, okay? But that means what? That the rulings of these surfaces, of this surface, they all pass through one point, alpha naught. So in geometric terms, this is, this is a cone, okay? But this was, again, trivial case 2A. Now let's do 2B, okay? So now suppose that alpha prime, alpha tilde prime is non-zero. Alpha tilde prime different from zero. So what can I say now? Well, let's take, let's see how x again looks like, so this is alpha plus VW, and now let's put the alpha tilde into the game. We found alpha tilde, okay, so alpha becomes alpha tilde plus mi W, okay, so this is alpha tilde of T plus mi of T W of T plus V, so again, W of T, okay? But now I know that W, if I want, I can divide. I mean, suppose for a moment, I mean, generically, I will be able to take this thing and put it here. So W is equal to that one. So this becomes alpha tilde of T plus mi of T plus V divided by lambda minus, these are all of t, lambda of t minus mi prime of t, everything times alpha tilde prime. Okay? Now, finally, I have to use the equation, otherwise, okay? Oh, but then you see why I gave you the definition at the beginning as an example, because now my surface looks like Alpha, some alpha, if you want, call it alpha tilde, beta, or however you want, plus this one, which you can call, if you want, v tilde, times alpha prime. So this is a tangent 
surface to a curve, to the curve alpha tilde. Okay, so this is the tangent surface to alpha tilde. Okay. Okay, so this was very simple, but what is the moral of this? Remember that we have always to, we are driving in the direction of understanding what is the geometric meaning of the Gauss curvature and in fact also of the mean curvature in 15 minutes, okay? So the first thing is, well, curvature should distinguish between flat and curved, okay? So naive question, above the big question if you want. So in general, you have a function, you want to understand what is the meaning of this function. So sub-question, easy level zero question, suppose this function is constant equal to zero. What does it mean? I mean, is the surface special? And then of course the answer is, well, yes, depending what you mean by special, but certainly it's not too special. So I hope I convinced you now that there are huge families of surfaces with constant zero Gauss curvature. Because see, all cylinders, all cones, and all tangent surfaces to curves, they all have Gauss curvature equal to zero. And in some sense, they are the only one. Okay? So, if you ask my four years, years, years old baby, he would say, well, okay, now that these are flat. But this seems to contradict openly our intuition of curvature. I mean, because remember, not even, not even this one is flat, that you can find some strange argument. But I mean, now a cylinder over any curve is flat. A cone over any curve is flat. So, the tangent surface to any curve is flat. Okay, so it's, now it looks desperate. Now you say, well, that means the Gauss curvature really maybe is not that interesting if it's not able to distinguish this, okay? So we have, the, the only point is that we have to work harder, okay? Now, let me enter the problem of mean curve, what does the mean curvature? I would like to play the same game with the mean curvature. Now, in fact, let me take a long route and we are going to learn something which is as important as the final point. In fact, probably even more important than the final point. Because we have treated the first fundamental form, you see, for example, in the consideration of Gauss curvature equal to zero, the first fundamental form was not really entering because it was always e g, little eg minus f squared, second fundamental form, divided by eg minus f squared, first fundamental form. But if you ask, is this zero or not, you don't care about the denominator. So it seems a property completely determined by the second fundamental form. And we, all, we also said, when we define the first fundamental form, we almost said, well, okay, it's just to, to do something. Since we call that the other one second, let's call something the first because it's not really adding any new information. It's the scalar product between tangent vectors. But now let's go back and let's throw away this snobbish attitude because the first fundamental form in fact measures many fundamental things. And at the end, in a couple of weeks, you will see it will measure all fundamental things. So, for example, let's ask the following question. Remember, we start with a regular surface, and suppose we have a local chart, okay? That means we have our usual picture. We have some domain here, U. We have a map X, and that, that's the image, okay? Now, suppose you take a curve on the surface, of course, inside this chart. I'm going to make local computation, so I will restrict myself to so suppose I have an alpha of t which lies on my surface S. So of course, since we are doing metric geometry, because everything which comes from the scalar product has something to do with the metric, okay? 
the, the simplest question in metric geometry is what is the length of a curve? And in fact, for when we studied curves by themselves, that was basically the only thing we could do. So how much is the length of this curve? Well, this is a curve in space. So the answer does not depend, doesn't seem to depend at first look from the surface S. You throw S away and you say, well, I have alpha of t, very well. The length of the curve alpha, let's say between two points of the interval, doesn't matter, is the integral of the norm of alpha prime. So suppose I have it parametrized by some t in dt, okay, between some t naught and t1, okay. You see that this doesn't seem to depend on the surface. In fact, does not depend on the surface, okay. You treat, you treat it just a, as, a, as a curve in space. But then, if the curve lies in a local chart, of course, there is the usual correspondence that we use every day. There is some curve here, beta of t, which is mapped to alpha. Okay? So you might ask now a more refined question, and this de depends on the surface, which is the relationship between the length of this curve in, pl in the plane and the length of this curve on the surface. So somehow, how much is distorting length, the map x? So the map x was fantastic from the study of, of surfaces, but it will change length, of course. Okay, there is no reason why in general, lengths of curves will correspond, okay? If I use this trick, of course, how much is alpha prime? I can, I can write alpha prime, so, because alpha becomes x composed beta, okay, as usual. So what is alpha prime? Well, alpha prime is u prime xu plus v prime xv. Okay, where of course I'm assuming, as usual, eh, all, all the usual notation. So beta of t will be given by two functions, u of t, v of t. Okay. But then, how much is the length of alpha? Well, in fact, before doing that, how much is the norm of alpha prime of t? So then I, I substitute into the integral, okay? How much is that? Well, it's the scalar product between this and itself. Well, divided by, I mean, square root, okay? So this becomes what? It's uh, in, uh, for the square root, this times this. So u prime squared e plus, and you can imagine twice, okay? u prime v prime f plus v prime squared g, everything to the power one half, okay? Oh, well, this is interesting because, okay, now put it, I don't even write it, but I mean, now L of alpha becomes, what is the difference, of course? is that if I write it in this way, I'm thinking of beta. I have the two functions, u and v of t, no? and in some sense, I'm comparing an integral here, so I'm comparing, I mean, this means that the, the philosophy, the geometric interpretation of the first fundamental form is exactly what I said before, because what would be the length of beta as a curve in the plane? Well, it would be the integral of beta prime. But what is beta prime? Well, beta is equal to u and v. It's just the integral of u prime squared plus v prime squared, one half in dt. So you see that the second fundamental, if the first fundamental form measures exactly this, is exactly the distortion of lengths of curves measured on the domain of a chart and on the image of the chart. The same curve, but once it's here and the other one is transported on the surface, okay? And here they come E, F, and G, very important, okay? We can play the same game with areas of domain, 
After all, so now let me draw the parallel picture, but it's always the same. I have my u x and now suppose I take some region here okay now <coughs> now suppose I have some region that I imagine Again, inside the chart. So it corresponds to some region which might look very different eh? here. So let me say this is just, this is V and this is X of V. Okay. Now, again, let's ask the same question but now with the area. So in some sense, I know how to measure the area of V. This is not a V prime. Eh? This was just... Uh, the area of V compared to the area of X of V. Okay? Well, here I have to give you a definition. But the definition is motivated by the following classical. If you are in R3, now let's, so this is a kind of a side note to justify what I'm going to say. If you take two vectors, which might not be orthogonal of unit norm or nothing, two just, of course, linearly independent, well, not even linearly independent. In some sense, it's a pathological case. Let's call it xi and eta in R3. Now, of course, two vectors in R3 give me a parallelogram. Okay, I can imagine, of, imagine this parallelogram here. How much is the area of this picture? Okay. Exactly. So the area of this region is given by the norm of this. In fact, it contains the pathological case because if it's zero, I mean, if they are parallel, you get zero as an area. Okay. This justifies the following definition. In fact, let me write it here. So I save a little bit of space. So the area of x of v, because I have to define it, actually it's not, okay? <coughs> uh, yeah, okay. Of x of v is equal to the integral of, well, okay. Why, why I'm going to write this formula? Because I want to apply this simple observation to the, which are the two vectors which play a role here, x u and x v. So you see, at this point of the surface, I have two canonical vectors tangent to the surface. And in some sense, I would, I want, I'm saying, what is the, the infinitesimal area? Well, generated by these two vectors, the norm of their wedge product, of the cross product, okay? But how much is the, the norm of this? Strange enough, but not, enough, not strange at all, is again the, the determinant of the first fundamental form. So this justifies, to define, justify the fact that the, I call the area of this region, the integral over V now as an integral here, EG minus F squared one half. Now is an integral in R2, so I know what to put there as a measure. So I put the standard Riemann measure, okay? Now here, the, now there is a problem. Because you see, I'm defining the area of a set on a surface, of a subset of the surface. And here I use, to define it, a chart. So now there is the usual problem. If I have two charts covering the same region, does the area depend on the chart or not? 
Because if I look at the formula, it does. OK? But this one, it's an exercise in calculus, and I leave it to you. Suppose that you have another chart. Y, if you want, capital Y, which now comes from an, another, which covers this, the same set, but now, for example, corresponding to a domain, let's say, capital W. OK? So this will have another, other coefficients of the first fundamental form, because the coefficients of the first fundamental form, of course, depends on x. But the point, you have to argue that this object here is well defined. Of course, E measured with x and E measured with y are different. F are different. G are different, but this integral is well defined. Of course, everything boils down to the change of, for, change of parameters formula okay, for integrals in Rn. Okay? And it works. So this is a well-defined integral. Maybe I'll put it in, a, in an exercise sheet so in case some of you have some problems, we can do it together, OK? But now again, you see this simple interpretation and general definition now tells me that the first fundamental form is exactly measuring the distortion. Now, this time is by definition, but I hope I convinced you that it's the right definition. The distortion of areas measured here and here. OK? So the first fundamental form, which seemed to be just a, way, just a name, is in fact taking care of the two major geometric things that you can do, measuring lengths of curves, measuring areas of domain. OK? OK, we will freeze this for later use. But now, let me go back to, in the same spirit we did the ruled surfaces. Now, thinking to the Gauss curvature 0, we studied ruled surfaces. Now, thinking to surfaces with 0 mean curvature, we do something else. And that's what we are going to do now. OK. Mm. Well, in fact, it's better to put it right from the beginning, the key definition. So a surface, a, sur a regular surface is called minimal. This is kind of the corresponding name to developable, OK? Minimal. If h is constant equal to 0. But now I want to convince you that this name has some sense. Minimal in which sense? OK. And this is, this is nice. So first, so the idea is the following. You have a surface. And again, you take just the piece of a surface covered by some parameterization, by some chart. I try to make a big picture, even though I will need so this will be x of u. And that means here I have some big domain u and the map x. OK? Now, suppose, in fact, this u in principle could be unbounded, non-compact, anything, OK? It's just an open subset of R2. So now suppose here I pick a bounded domain d, OK? So now d is a bounded domain. So x from u to s is a local chart. d contained in u is a bounded domain. Actually, here, there I, I, I drew it closed, but I don't want it to be necessarily closed. In fact, usually a domain is open. Okay, so 
In fact, to make it proper, you have to remove the boundary, OK? And now suppose you take a differentiable function, h, from the closure of d to r, differentiable okay, from the closure of d. Okay, I will call the normal variation in the direction of determined by h or in the direction that by h. So the normal, so this is the definition of this word, of this sentence. The normal variation in the of of x of d closed determined by h or in the direction of h if you want is the map let me call it phi okay phi from where from d bar cross a small interval so for some epsilon positive which doesn't matter into R3, which takes, so D is inside U. So in U, we have the two coordinates U and V. OK, so I, it takes U, V, and, the, and let me call T the parameter in this small interval. And gives me what? Gives me X of U, V, so the corresponding point to the, on the surface, plus T h is again a function of u and v, OK? So n at the point u, v. So what's going on? Nothing worrying. In some sense, I should draw the graph of h over d. And this is kind of difficult now in the picture, but you can imagine, OK? So you have a function defined on the closed domain d bar. So imagine a graph here. And now I'm taking phi is what? Is the corresponding point on the surface. So here I have a normal vector. At this point, h has some value. For example, let's say, for example, it's positive. Otherwise, I need to draw it the other way. And here I take the point phi of uv plus t, OK, uvt, OK? So that means, geometrically, it's simple. It's more, I mean, if you think of what's going on, you, are, you have a graph here on the flat R2. And basically, you are drawing the graph here, OK, in the normal direction, the graph of h transported here, OK? So this is the idea. Of course, the graph at height t, it's a family of graphs, OK? But of course, the role of t is just to push it, to translate it, OK? To translate it in the normal direction. It's not a translation in R3, because n depends on the point, OK? So you see, for t equal to 0, this, of course, is not there. And phi takes the value x. So for t equal to 0, I'm just taking this disk, for example, in my case, and I'm putting it here somewhere. So this will be x of d, of d closed. Okay? And then as t moves, I start moving this. It's not even a disk anymore, but I mean the image of this disk, using h as a kind of a graph function. OK, I'm writing something nearby. Now, for small t, it will be very close to that one. By using h. OK, is it clear geometrically what's going on? So for example, if h is equal to 1, constant equal to 1, what am I doing? I'm taking really x plus tn. OK, so I'm really moving this object, this piece of the surface, in the normal direction. Okay. Every point of the same at the same speed. So h is a parameter which gives you the freedom that one point is moving quick and one point is moving slow. Or maybe one point is going up and the other point is going down. Because if h changes sign, of course, the graph would be a bit above and a bit below, for example. 
Okay, just to keep to have an imagination of what's going on. Okay. Now notation, and you might say why it's not the initial notation. So for fixed, so I call this a normal variation, okay? And it's clear why. It's a variation because for t equal to zero, it's the old one, and it's normal because every point is pushed in the normal direction. Okay? So for, for t in minus epsilon epsilon, I want to think of this uh, of a variation as a family of regular surfaces. And of course I can do it because I define x, uh, now I put the t here, of uv to be phi. You see, if I fix t, I'm taking the slice. Okay, but that's again a regular surface. It's a surface which is very close to the old one. It has moved with the function h. Okay, so to each of these surfaces, so if I keep t fixed, I can study the geometry that we studied up to now of the surface xt. Let's do it. Okay, so. Basically, I want to know how much is x t u. No? So now I have a parameter, which is t, and two parameters, u and v, which are giving the surface. Well, how much is x u? Well, x u will be x u without the t, no? plus something. x u plus t h u n plus t uh, h n u. Okay, how much is xv? The same thing, changing Okay, so how much are the first? In principle, I could compute the coefficients of the first fundamental form for each t. Okay, let's do it. So what is, and I call it ET, no? ET will be the first coefficients of the first fundamental form of the surface XT. Well, that means it's this squared, okay? Imagine you are, we are doing it, okay? So now, let me save three seconds, and we are taking the scalar product of this times this, plus T, H, and U. Okay. <laughs> what can I do? And how do I want to do it? Because of course the only thing I could say is to expand everything, it becomes a mess and I stop. But the thing I'm interested in is this will be a function. Now, now I want to see it as a function of t. Okay. So for t equal to z, I want to make, in some sense, the Taylor expansion in t, okay? So I want to know what is the t equal to zero, or the, what would be the constant in the Taylor expansion? And then what is the linear part in t? And then what is the quadratic part in t, and so on? I want to split it in degree with respect to t, okay? Well, for t equal to zero, it's easy because, of course, the only known constant in t, eh? now my speaking is referred to the variable t. The only non-constant object is x u x u. So not strange, it starts with the old one. After all, for t equal to zero, the surface was the old one. So what is, what is there in t? So plus t what? <coughs> well, of course, I don't, the only thing I don't have to do is a scalar product of something multiplied by t with something multiplied by t, because I would get a t squared, okay? So for example, suppose we do it, so this one times what? This one times this, but x, u, and n are orthogonal by definition, okay? So this one is not there. So there is the next one, so x, u, scalar this. Okay, let's write it. So plus t times h, x, u, n, u. Okay, it will be longer than this, so. 
And then I'm done with this one. Now, what about this? Well, this one goes against xu, but gives me 0. And then goes against anything, because there, is, there would be t squared. So this one goes away in the, in the linear part. And this one gives me th, so t is there, h is here, and u x u. So I get twice this, OK? Plus, so let me write it in this form, plus o of t squared. So the point I want to make is that I, now I don't care. The t squared coefficient would be much more complicated, but I'm interested in the linear part. Let's play the same game with f. ft is what? Now imagine we are taking this color this. So of course it starts with f. And then what is t what? So this times this, 0. This times this, h, x, u, and v. OK? And I'm done with this one. Then this one, but this, this is 0. And then everything else is t squared. And this is what? This is n, u, x, v. plus o of t squared, OK? And g. gt is g, again, now it's this against this. So this times this is 0. This times this gives me, of course, by symmetry, if you want, you know it, OK? So it's t 2a, sorry, 2h x v n v, OK? Plus o of t squared. OK. Now I can write, in fact, I should have left one line. Because I know what are these. These have a name in our language. Because you see, these ones are computed at t equal to 0. Here, there is not a t here. And there is no t here. So these are the original objects. OK. So I know what they are. For example, this one is what? Is minus e. OK? So what I found, so in fact, let me rewrite it. It's a pity. So e minus 2hte, OK, plus of t squared. OK, when I write, in fact, let's invent a symbol, OK? This means up to second order. OK, so we save time. How much is f? ft would be f. OK, and now here it seems slightly more complicated, but it's not. Because you, both of them are f. OK, they look different, but then you think coming from n scalar x u equal to 0 and then scalar x v equal to 0, whatever derivative you take, you get that these are equal to minus f. OK, so this would be minus 2 t h f. So, and this would be again up to second order, and g t is up to second order g minus 2htg, 2htg, OK? Very well. We are halfway through. But then, remember, it's not there anymore, but the formula for the area, the area of a region, the area for the region was given by the integral of eg minus f squared, 1 half du dv. OK? So it's quite clear. Now we are going to speculate on that. But for the moment, it's quite clear that we want to perform this computation. So we want to know how this object depends on t. Again, with the same spirit. First zero order, first order, and higher order. OK? So et times gt minus ft squared. Well, the 1 half we'll take care about later. Now, a little imagination.
and you get this. You get, of course, the zero order is the old one. So this is eg minus f squared plus t times what? In fact, I should have put minus because there is a minus in front of everything. Okay, Minus this object here, minus, in fact, even a 2h is in front of everything. Okay, No surprise, 2h times eg minus 2ff minus plus eg. And here, this is again up to second order. Okay, this is immediate. Eh? I'm not. <coughs> but now you remember, you, I mean, you don't remember, and you are allowed not to remember. Even I don't remember, but that we have a formula for H in terms of all these num functions, okay? H of the original surface, H of the surface at t equal to zero. And if you use it, which in fact was actually just telling you that H is this divided by Eg minus F squared capital, okay? Well, if So imagine what we are doing. We divide by eg minus f squared, and we multiply by eg minus f squared. But that means I can take out eg minus f squared from everything. So I can say that this is equal to eg minus f squared times something, which starts with 1, okay, minus 2h, 2th. And now the only problem is that this is so this divided by eg minus f squared is not exactly h, but it's twice h. Okay, so this becomes 4 capital H. Okay. And now let's compute the variation of the area. So in, you see, the spirit is these surfaces are moving. But somehow, they are all image of the same thing. So if I, since I define the area of a surface as the area of the, of the coming domain, of the original domain, but measured with a strange measure. So measured with the measure coming from the first fundamental form. Because here, the integrals are always with respect to du dv. But there is the function in front square root of eg minus f squared, OK? So if I have two surfaces, which are image of the same thing, I can transport the, 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 the problem of computing the area becomes a problem here on the fixed domain, but with measures which are changing, OK? And that's what I want to do. So the area of what? Of how did we call it? Of xt of d bar. Okay. So for each t, I look at this strange graph, normal graph, and I measure its area, but of the same domain. Okay, so this is equal by definition of the area over the integral over d bar. So it's an integral in R2. So I should put here the square root of this. So eg minus f squared 1 half times, and here again there is up to higher order, eh? because I dropped the higher order terms, times 1 minus 4th h 1 half. And, but then everything is integrated with respect to the u dv. OK. Uh, 
But now, let's compute d in dt. So how, how is it changing? So the derivative at t equal to 0 of this function. This is a function of t. Okay, so for each time I have a surface, I measure the air, I have a number, so I have a function. Okay, I take the derivative of t equal to zero. Well, simple, so you see, this does not depend on t now. Okay, so you have just to take the derivative of this, evaluate the t equal to zero, and you get this. This is minus the integral over d bar of, of 2 h h times eg minus f squared one half du dv. Okay, this is take the derivative and then evaluate at t equal to zero. Okay, there is nothing there. Oh, but now we are. This is a very interesting formula. Because you see, especially, you see, the key point is that here you have isolated. So this is a kind of a positive function. And here you have in front these two objects, OK? Every time you see something like this, this is easy to interpret. Because the point is, if h is, con if you have a surface, if you have played this game starting from a surface which was minimal, so h equal to 0, OK? So me, for example, there is a stupid, uh, simple, there is a simple error here. So if the, the initial surface, x, is minimal, then this object, the derivative of the area, in any direction, well, in the normal direction, but using any function, would be 0. It's a critical point. OK? <coughs> well, uh, it's uh, if you want, if s is minimal, but here the analysis takes care only of what's going on inside the chart x. So it, the, the important thing is that h is equal to 0 on this part. OK? So if you want, if s is minimal, but I mean, what you care is that the mean curvature is 0 on x of d bar, OK? But now, this formula, it's not difficult to see that implies also the other way around. So, because if this object, first variation of area, is equal to 0 for any h, you see that this is a huge condition. And you can imagine, I mean, I'm not going to give you a complete proof because I hope you see it. Okay? If h was not 0 at some point, it's easy to build a little h for which this is non-zero. You see why? Now, I mean, the idea is, in fact, it's this is even the proof in some sense. But I mean, suppose for a moment that we are drawing our surfaces flat, otherwise the pictures become impossible for me. So you have a surface, OK? And at this point, h is equal to 1. Sorry, this is the normal vector. And at this point, p, h of p is equal to 1, for example. OK, so then how do I argue that this integral cannot be 0 for any h? That's enough, because I build a little. So if h is equal to 1 at one point, by continuity, it will be, so if I draw the graph, OK, here it's 1, and here it will be whatever it is. I don't care. I build, because you see, here I get the product. OK, so I really don't care about capital H as long as it's non-zero. I build, for example, a function which is 0, 0, 0, 0, and then and this is little h, OK? And I choose this small interval in a way that on this small interval, even capital H, for example, is positive. If it's 1 at one point, there will be a small d where it's positive. 
Okay? So you build a little h like this. But then h h is a positive function, whatever capital H was. Okay? Over the whole D. So this is positive. This is positive, the integral cannot be zero. Okay? Well, that's in fact the proof. So if the variation, if the first variation of the area is equal to zero for any variation, then h is equal to zero. Okay. Now, this is a beautiful theorem. It's one of the building blocks of the modern differential geometry, okay, in some sense. But now, in the spirit of what we did for ruled surfaces, so we wanted to say, well, k equal to zero was meaningful. I mean, for example, was it the plane or maybe just the plane and the cylinder? And we, had, we came up with a huge family of examples. So whatever the truth will be, it will be more complicated than that. Now, h equal to zero, now we know a variational characterization of surfaces with h equal to zero. But in principle, it could be the empty set. Well, not really empty because you know the plane. The plane is a minimal surface, okay? But are there other minimal surfaces? Well, first, a, 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 just a language problem. The name minimal is very misleading in some sense because it's a critical point of the area functional. Nowhere is written there that it's a minimum. Minimum would mean compute the second derivative and prove that this is non-negative. And this is highly false, okay? So in fact, the search of minimal surfaces in R3, it's the search for unstable critical points of a functional, which is more complicated, of course, much more complicated than if your functional has minima, you minimize and you try to do something, okay? Here, all these objects, except for the plane, the plane is the only minimum, okay? So the word minimal, but unfortunately, it comes from... Uh, Lagrange, and when something comes from such a big guy, you shut up, but it's, it's kind of, remember, minimal in this theory means critical point and not minimum, okay? So the problem is, are there other minimal surfaces or not? Because maybe we are speaking about the empty set. We did a beautiful exercise in uh, differential geometry, but, well, you know another one. In fact, you know two, okay? <laughs> I knew one and you knew another, so, you, so we know two, two. So the first one, or I don't know if it was the first or the second, but this is one, catenoid, okay? The catenoid is a minimal surface, okay? But then why this was a kind of a, a huge problem in mathematics? Because this is a very natural interpretation in terms of if I just find, okay? So this was the way the theory of minimal surfaces was born. Kids, kids playing with soap. In fact, physicists playing with membranes, okay? Take a wire, put it in, a, in soap, and pull it up, okay? Now, believe that there is a correspondence between the area of the surface that you get and somehow the amount of energy that the soap has to waste to cover, to span this wire. The soap will make an effort, okay? You have fixed the boundary and the soap will try to minimize the effort to span the boundary. So the soap is going to produce a minimal surface. It, it's going to produce the minimal surface when you have fixed the boundary. Somehow you are telling the soap something. I want you to span this piece of wire. Usually kids play with, in fact, it's not true anymore. I have been playing with round soap wires 
And then the solution was quite boring because you put it there, you peel it up, and you get a disk. Okay? But we are mathematicians, and we think, why if we play to soap bubbles with, with something like this? Okay? This is a wire. You put it in soap, and you pull it up. Is there, so what's the soap going to do? Well, this, this is already an interesting example, because this shows you that the soap gets crazy, doesn't know what to do. There are two minimal surfaces. Okay? In fact, one has bigger area, so in fact the soap doesn't get crazy this time, because it will choose this one. Okay? But you see, now you have formulated a problem. Given a boundary, a, curve in, a closed curve in space, is there a minimal surface with this boundary in R3? This was a classical problem in physics. Okay? It's formulated with soap because it's easy, because everybody has played with soap bubbles. But it's clearly a very general family of problems. Okay? Give me a rule for which area corresponds to energy or effort or whatever you want, and you will end up studying soap bubbles. Okay, so that's why you will find many books in mathematics library speaking about soap bubbles, because it's the prototype. And it's already very difficult. Okay? And in fact, you can go, in fact, the helicoid, I didn't print a copy of the helicoid, I have a picture of the helicoid, but the helicoid is another minimal surface. So you start seeing that they look very different. But you cannot even imagine how different. Okay? Because, for example, this is another minimal surface. It's periodic in space. It's contained in a cube, and then you start duplicating the cube with this surface inside, and you invade the whole of R3. The gray areas are the holes. Okay? So with something like this, for example, you construct a minimal network of plumbing. Okay? These are plums. Okay? Minimizing the area means you are using the least possible steel. Okay? Since nature does these things, in fact, this surface exists in nature. It's called the Schwarz surface. Okay? But then you start getting more and more complicated objects. So this, would, this looks more or less like a catenoid. You see, for example, if you take a cut, the stupid thing would be stupid, stupid, but I mean, you take a catenoid, and you take a plane orthogonal to the axis of the catenoid, for example. So in fact, the union of these two things is a minimal surface. The only problem is not really a regular surface, because they intersect in a, in a nasty way. It's not a differentiable surface. So the question we have been for many, many years, is it possible to smooth a configuration like this, keeping h equal to 0? Because in some sense, formally, this object has h equal to 0. It's either the chitinoid or the plane, it's OK. And the answer turns out to be yes. But this is an extremely well, beautiful and difficult problem, which was solved actually uh, in the, the beginning of the 90s. Okay? So we are speaking about very recent stuff. And there are still people asking, in how many ways? OK? Because actually, these objects do exist. So it's one of those points where mathematics and nature work together, OK? So you really, want, you really like to have a classification of minimal surfaces, because these things exist. So we know enough to say that there are plenty of them. But we are very, very way, be, way behind the classification in some sense. Okay? It's a beautiful research area. Because, of course, you can imagine that behind this picture, there is also a huge computational and graphic, 3D graphic problem. Because if you think that you are going to prove that this object is a minimal surface by telling me which is x, forget it. Okay? You will never be able to write down the explicit solution. Unless it's the catenoid or the helicoid, you are lost. Either you have some method to prove that something exists. So it's, uh, proofs are very mathematical, and then you wonder, well, but how do they look like? So there are the pure problems and the applied problems, and say, well, OK, now I want a picture. Okay. 
Very well. Well, I think. Oh, but just since we have, I told you a little bit of history, let's go back to the boundary problem. Because I, I'm drawing you pictures, I, I showed you pictures of complete surfaces, no? I mean, things that which go to infinity and so on. But somehow the kid's problem was a boundary value problem. You take a a wire, you put it in soap, and now you have forced the, the soap to span this wire, and you want the minimal surface with this boundary. Okay? So, does it always exist? Well, this is a, a very nice, I mean, some of, one of the crucial problems, basic problems in the calculus of variations. And this, is so, this was solved in 1930, uh, for, any, for any curve and fixing some kind of topological type of the surface that you are looking at, by two mathematicians, an American and uh, an Hungarian, Douglas and Radeau. For some reason, which has never been completely clear to me, um, the first Fields Medal, you know that mathematician, you, you can dream, I cannot. I'm one year and a half too old. I stopped dreaming one year and a half ago, so I joined a big group of people who didn't win the Fields Medal. <laughs> <laughs> okay? I like to be in the majority. You know, so. <laughs> but, so the mathematical community, so we don't have the Nobel Prize. So we invented another prize at the beginning of the 20th century, which is called the Fields Medal, which has to be given to one mathematician below 40 and so on. Who has made some, so the first Fields Medal in, his, in the history of mathematics has been given to Douglas for solving this problem, which is called the Plateau problem. Plateau was the physicist who has set up some kind of the basic physics to speak about this problem, okay, in the late 19th century. So somehow it's also the beginning of this, uh, I don't know why they chose Douglas instead of Radeau. I mean, now we consider the two proofs correct. So probably at that time there was a more controversial issue. They really came up at the same time with the proof, so. Okay, that's it, and we'll see on Thursday. <laughs>